Section One of A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Wonder Book for Girls and Boys by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Introductory to The Gorgon's Head. Beneath the porch of the country seat called Tanglewood, one fine autumnal morning, was assembled a merry part of little folks, with a tall youth in the midst of them. They had planned a nutting expedition, and were impatiently waiting for the mist to roll up the hill slopes, and for the sun to pour the warmth of the Indian summer over the fields and pastures, and into the nooks of the many-coloured woods there was a prospect of as fine a day as ever gladdened the aspect of this beautiful and comfortable world as yet however the morning mist filled up the whole length and breadth of the valley above which on a gently sloping eminence the mansion stood this body of white vapour extended to within less than a hundred yards of the house it completely hid everything beyond that distance except a few ruddy or yellow tree-tops which here and there emerged and were glorified by the early sunshine as was likewise the broad surface of the mists four or five miles off to the southward rose the summit of monument mountain and seemed to be floating on a cloud some fifteen miles farther away in the same direction appeared the loftier dome of taconic looking blue and indistinct and hardly so substantial as the vapoury sea that almost rolled over it the nearer hills which bordered the valley were half submerged and were specked with little cloud wreaths all the way to their tops on the whole there was so much cloud and so little solid earth that it had the effect of a vision the children above mentioned being as full of life as they could hold kept overflowing from the porch of tanglewood and scampering along the gravel walk or rushing across the dewy herbage of the lawn i can hardly tell how many of these small people there were not less than nine or ten however no more than a dozen of all sorts sizes and ages whether girls or boys they were brothers sisters and cousins together with a few of their young acquaintances who had been invited by mr and mrs pringle to spend some of this delightful weather with their own children at tanglewood i am afraid to tell you their names or even to give them any names which other children have ever been called by because to my certain knowledge authors sometimes get themselves into great trouble by accidentally giving the names of real persons to the characters in their books for this reason i mean to call them primrose periwinkle sweet fern dandelion blue eye clover huckleberry cowslip squash blossom milkweed plantain and buttercup although to be sure such titles might better suit a group of fairies than a company of earthly children it is not to be supposed that these little folks were to be permitted by their careful fathers and mothers uncles aunts or grandparents to stray abroad into the woods and fields without the guardianship of some particularly grave and elderly person oh no indeed in the first sentence of my book you will recollect that i spoke of a tall youth standing in the midst of the children his name and i shall let you know his real name because he considers it a great honour to have told the stories that are here to be printed his name was eustace bright he was a student at williams college and had reached i think at this period the venerable age of eighteen years so that he felt quite like a grandfather towards periwinkle dandelion huckleberry squash blossom milkweed and the rest who were only half or a third as venerable as he a trouble in his eyesight such as many students think it necessary to have nowadays in order to prove their diligence at their books had kept him from college a week or two after the beginning of the term but for my part 
i have seldom met with a pair of eyes that looked as if they could see farther or better than those of eustace bright this learned student was slender and rather pale as all yankee students are but yet of a healthy aspect and as light and active as if he had wings to his shoes by the by being much addicted to wading through streamlets and across meadows he had put on cowhide boots for the expedition he wore a linen blouse a cloth cap and a pair of green spectacles which he had assumed probably less for the preservation of his eyes than for the dignity that they imparted to his countenance in either case however he might as well have left them alone for huckleberry a mischievous little elf crept behind eustace as he sat on the steps of the porch snatched the spectacles from his nose and clapped them on her own and as the student forgot to take them back they fell off into the grass and lay there till the next spring now eustace bright you must know had won great fame among the children as a narrator of wonderful stories and though he sometimes pretended to be annoyed when they teased him for more and more and always for more yet i really doubt whether he liked anything quite so well as to tell them you might have seen his eyes twinkle therefore when clover sweet fern cowslip buttercup and most of their playmates besought him to relate one of his stories while they were waiting for the mist to clear up yes cousin eustace said primrose who was a bright girl of twelve with laughing eyes and a nose that turned up a little the morning is certainly the best time for the stories with which you so often tire out our patience we shall be in less danger of hurting your feelings by falling asleep at the most interesting points as little cowslip and i did last night naughty primrose cried cowslip a child of six years old i did not fall asleep and i only shut my eyes so as to see a picture of what cousin eustace was telling about his stories are good to hear at night because we can dream about them asleep and good in the morning too because then we can dream about them awake so i hope he will tell us one this very minute thank you my little cowslip said eustace certainly you shall have the best story i can think of if it were only for defending me so well from that naughty primrose but children i have already told you so many fairy tales that i doubt whether there is a single one which you have not heard at least twice over i am afraid you will fall asleep in reality if i repeat any of them again no 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 cried blue eye periwinkle plantain and half a dozen others we like a story all the better for having heard it two or three times before and it is a truth as regards children that a story seems often to deepen its mark in their interest not merely by two or three but by numberless repetitions but eustace bright in the exuberance of his resources scorned to avail himself of an advantage which an older story-teller would have been glad to grasp at it would be a great pity said he if a man of my learning to say nothing of original fancy could not find a new story every day year in and year out for children such as you i will tell you one of the nursery tales that were made for the amusement of our great old grandmother the earth when she was a child in frock and pinafore there are a hundred such and it is a wonder to me that they have not long ago been put into picture books for little girls and boys but instead of that old grey-bearded grandsires pore over them in musty volumes of greek and puzzle themselves with trying to find out when and how and for what they were made well 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 cousin eustace cried all the children at once talk no more about your stories but begin sit down then every soul of you said eustace bright and be all as still as so many mice at the slightest interruption whether from great naughty primrose little dandelion or any other i shall bite the story short off between my teeth and swallow the untold part but in the first place 
do any of you know what a gorgon is i do said primrose then hold your tongue rejoined eustace who had rather she would have known nothing about the matter hold all your tongues and i shall tell you a sweet pretty story of a gorgon's head and so he did as you may begin to read on the next page working up his sophomorical erudition with a good deal of tact and incurring great obligations to professor anthon he nevertheless disregarded all classical authorities whenever the vagrant audacity of his imagination impelled him to do so end of section one section two of a wonder book for girls and boys this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a wonder book for girls and boys by nathaniel hawthorne the gorgon's head part 1 perseus was the son of danae who was the daughter of a king and when perseus was a very little boy some wicked people put his mother and himself into a chest and set them afloat upon the sea the wind blew freshly and drove the chest away from the shore and the uneasy billows tossed it up and down while danae clasped her child closely to her bosom and dreaded that some big wave would dash its foamy crest over them both the chest sailed on however and neither sank nor was upset until when night was coming it floated so near an island that it got entangled in a fisherman's nets and was drawn out high and dry upon the sand the island was called seraphus and it was reigned over by king polydectes who happened to be the fisherman's brother this fisherman i am happy to tell you was an exceedingly humane and upright man he showed great kindness to danae and her little boy and continued to befriend them until perseus had grown to be a handsome youth very strong and active and skilful in the use of arms long before this time king polydectes had seen the two strangers the mother and her child who had come to his dominions in a floating chest as he was not good and kind like his brother the fisherman but extremely wicked he resolved to send perseus on a dangerous enterprise in which he would probably be killed and then to do some great mischief to danae herself so this bad-hearted king spent a long while in considering what was the most dangerous thing that a young man could possibly undertake to perform at last having hit upon an enterprise that promised to turn out as fatally as he desired he sent for the youthful perseus the young man came to the palace and found the king sitting upon his throne perseus said king polydectes smiling craftily upon him you are grown up a fine young man you and your good mother have received a great deal of kindness from myself as well as from my worthy brother the fisherman and i suppose you would not be sorry to repay some of it please your majesty answered perseus i would willingly risk my life to do so well then continued the king still with a cunning smile on his lips i have a little adventure to propose to you and as you are a brave and enterprising youth you will doubtless look upon it as a great piece of good luck to have so rare an opportunity of distinguishing yourself you must know my good perseus i think of getting married to the beautiful princess hippodamia and it is customary on these occasions to make the bride a present of some far-fetched and elegant curiosity i have been a little perplexed i must honestly confess where to obtain anything likely to please a princess of her exquisite taste but this morning i flatter myself i have thought of precisely the article and can i assist your majesty in obtaining it cried perseus eagerly you can if you are as brave a youth as i believe you to be replied king polydectes with the utmost graciousness of manner the bridal gift which i have set my heart on presenting to the beautiful hippodamia 
is the head of the gorgon medusa with the snaky locks and i depend on you my dear perseus to bring it to me so as i am anxious to settle affairs with the princess the sooner you go in quest of the gorgon the better i shall be pleased i will set out to-morrow morning answered perseus pray do so my gallant youth rejoined the king and perseus in cutting off the gorgon's head be careful to make a clean stroke so as not to injure its appearance you must bring it home in the very best condition in order to suit the exquisite taste of the beautiful princess hippodamia perseus left the palace but was scarcely out of hearing before polydectes burst into a laugh being greatly amused wicked king that he was to find how readily the young man fell into the snare the news quickly spread abroad that perseus had undertaken to cut off the head of medusa with the snaky locks everybody was rejoiced for most of the inhabitants of the island were as wicked as the king himself and would have liked nothing better than to see some enormous mischief happen to danae and her son the only good man in this unfortunate island of seraphus appears to have been the fisherman as perseus walked along therefore the people pointed after him and made mouths and winked to one another and ridiculed him as loudly as they dared ho ho cried they medusa's snakes will sting him soundly now there were three gorgons alive at that period and they were the most strange and terrible monsters that had ever been since the world was made or that have been seen in after days or that are likely to be seen in all time to come i hardly know what sort of creature or hobgoblin to call them they were three sisters and seemed to have borne some distant resemblance to women but were really a very frightful and mischievous species of dragon it is indeed difficult to imagine what hideous beings these three sisters were why instead of locks of hair if you can believe me they had each of them a hundred enormous snakes growing on their heads all alive twisting wriggling curling and thrusting out their venomous tongues with forked stings at the end the teeth of the gorgons were terribly long tusks their hands were made of brass and their bodies were all over scales which if not iron were something as hard and impenetrable they had wings too and exceedingly splendid ones i can assure you for every feather in them was pure bright glittering burnished gold and they looked very dazzlingly no doubt when the gorgons were flying about in the sunshine but when people happened to catch a glimpse of their glittering brightness aloft in the air they seldom stopped to gaze but ran and hid themselves as speedily as they could you will think perhaps they were afraid of being stung by the serpents that served the gorgons instead of hair or of having their heads bitten off by their ugly tusks or of being torn all to pieces by their brazen claws well to be sure these were some of the dangers but by no means the greatest nor the most difficult to avoid for the worst things about these abominable gorgons was that if once a poor mortal fixed his eyes full upon one of their faces he was certain that very instant to be changed from warm flesh and blood into cold and lifeless stone thus as you will easily perceive it was a very dangerous adventure that the wicked king polydectes had contrived for this innocent young man perseus himself when he had thought over the matter could not help seeing that he had very little chance of coming safely through it and that he was far more likely to become a stone image than to bring back the head of medusa with the snaky locks for not to speak of other difficulties there was one which it would have puzzled an older man than perseus to get over not only must he fight with and slay this golden-winged iron-scaled long-tusked brazen-clawed snaky-haired monster but he must do it with his eyes shut or at least without so much as a glance at the enemy with whom he was contending else while his arm was lifted to strike 
he would stiffen into stone and stand with that uplifted arm for centuries until time and the wind and weather should crumple him quite away this would be a very sad thing to befall a young man who wanted to perform a great many brave deeds and to enjoy a great deal of happiness in this bright and beautiful world so disconsolate did these thoughts make him that perseus could not bear to tell his mother what he had undertaken to do he therefore took his shield girded on his sword and crossed over from the island to the mainland where he sat down in a solitary place and hardly refrained from shedding tears but while he was in this sorrowful mood he heard a voice close beside him perseus said the voice why are you sad he lifted his head from his hands in which he had hidden it and behold all alone as perseus had supposed himself to be there was a stranger in the solitary place it was a brisk intelligent and remarkably shrewd-looking young man with a cloak over his shoulders and an odd sort of cap on his head a strangely twisted staff in his hand and a short and very crooked sword hanging by his side he was exceedingly light and active in his figure like a person much accustomed to gymnastic exercises and well able to leap or run above all the stranger had such a cheerful knowing and helpful aspect though it was certainly a little mischievous into the bargain that perseus could not help feeling his spirits grow livelier as he gazed at him besides being really a courageous youth he felt greatly ashamed that anybody should have found him with tears in his eyes like a timid little schoolboy when after all there might be no occasion for despair so perseus wiped his eyes and answered the stranger pretty briskly putting on as brave a look as he could i am not so very sad said he only thoughtful about an adventure that i have undertaken oh ho answered the stranger well tell me all about it and possibly i may be of service to you i have helped a good many young men through adventures that looked difficult enough beforehand perhaps you may have heard of me i have more names than one but the name of quicksilver suits me as well as any other tell me what the trouble is and we will talk the matter over and see what can be done the stranger's words and manner put perseus into quite a different mood from his former one he resolved to tell quicksilver all his difficulties since he could not easily be worse off than he already was and very possibly his new friend might give him some advice that would turn out well in the end so he let the stranger know in few words precisely what the case was how that king polydectes wanted the head of medusa with the snaky locks as a bridal gift for the beautiful princess hippodamia and how that he had undertaken to get it for him but was afraid of being turned into stone and that would be a great pity said quicksilver with his mischievous smile you would make a very handsome marble statue it is true and it would be a considerable number of centuries before you crumpled away but on the whole one would rather be a young man for a few years than a stone image for a great many oh far rather exclaimed perseus with the tears again standing in his eyes and besides what would my dear mother do if her beloved son were turned into a stone well well let us hope that the affair will not turn out so very badly replied quicksilver in an encouraging tone i am the very person to help you if anybody can my sister and myself will do our utmost to bring you safe through the adventure ugly as it now looks your sister repeated perseus yes my sister said the stranger she is very wise i promise you and as for myself i generally have all my wits about me such as they are if you show yourself bold and cautious and follow our advice you need not fear being a stone image yet a while but first of all you must polish your shield till you can see your face in it as distinctly as in a mirror well this seemed to perseus rather an odd beginning of the adventure 
for he thought it of far more consequence that the shield be strong enough to defend him from the gorgon's brazen claws than that it should be bright enough to show him the reflection of his face however concluding that quicksilver knew better than himself he immediately set to work and scrubbed the shield with so much diligence and good will that it very quickly shone like the moon at harvest time quicksilver looked at it with a smile and nodded his approbation then taking off his own short and crooked sword he girded it about perseus instead of the one which he had before worn no sword but mine will answer your purpose observed he the blade has a most excellent temper and will cut through iron and brass as easily as through the slenderest twig and now we will set out the next thing is to find the three gray women who will tell us where to find the nymphs the three gray women cried perseus to whom this seemed only a new difficulty in the path of his adventure pray who may the three gray women be i have never heard of them before they are three very strange old ladies said quicksilver laughing they have but one eye among them and only one tooth moreover you must find them out by starlight or in the dusk of the evening for they never show themselves by the light either of the sun or moon but said perseus why should i waste my time with these three gray women would it not be better to set out at once in search of the terrible gorgons no no answered his friend there are other things to be done before you can find your way to the gorgons there is nothing for it but to hunt up these old ladies and when we meet with them you may be sure that the gorgons are not a great way off come let us be stirring perseus by this time felt so much confidence in his companion's sagacity that he made no more objections and professed himself ready to begin the adventure immediately they accordingly set out and walked at a pretty brisk pace so brisk indeed that perseus found it rather difficult to keep up with his nimble friend quicksilver to say the truth he had a singular idea that quicksilver was furnished with a pair of winged shoes which of course helped him along marvellously and then too when perseus looked sideways at him out of the corner of his eye he seemed to see wings on the sides of his head although if he turned a full gaze there were no such things to be perceived but only an odd kind of cap but at all events the twisted staff was evidently a great convenience to quicksilver and enabled him to proceed so fast that perseus though a remarkably active young man began to be out of breath here cried quicksilver at last for he knew well enough rogue that he was how hard perseus found it to keep pace with him take you the staff for you need it a great deal more than i are there no better walkers than yourself in the island of seraphus i could walk pretty well said perseus glancing slyly at his companion's feet if i had only a pair of winged shoes we must see about getting you a pair answered quicksilver but the staff helped perseus along so bravely that he no longer felt the slightest weariness in fact the stick seemed to be alive in his hand and to lend some of its life to perseus he and quicksilver now walked onward at their ease talking very sociably together and quicksilver told so many pleasant stories about his former adventures and how well his wits had served him on various occasions that perseus began to think him a very wonderful person he evidently knew the world and nobody is so charming to a young man as a friend who has that kind of knowledge perseus listened the more eagerly in the hope of brightening his own wits by what he heard at last he happened to recollect that quicksilver had spoken of a sister who was to lend her assistance in the adventure which they were now bound upon where is she he inquired shall we not meet her soon all in the proper time said his companion but this sister of mine you must understand is quite a different sort of character from myself she is very grave and prudent seldom smiles never laughs and makes it a rule not to utter a word unless she has something particularly profound to say 
neither will she listen to any but the wisest conversation dear me ejaculated perseus i shall be afraid to say a syllable she is a very accomplished person i assure you continued quicksilver and has all the arts and sciences at her fingers ends in short she is so immoderately wise that many people call her wisdom personified but to tell you the truth she has hardly vivacity enough for my taste and i think you would scarcely find her so pleasant a travelling companion as myself she has her good points nevertheless and you will find the benefits of them in your encounter with the gorgons by this time it had grown quite dusk they were now come to a very wild and desert place overgrown with shaggy bushes and so silent and solitary that nobody seemed ever to have dwelt or journeyed there all was waste and desolate in the grey twilight which grew every moment more obscure perseus looked about him rather disconsolately and asked quicksilver whether they had a great deal farther to go hist hist whispered his companion make no noise this is just the time and place to meet the three grey women be careful that they do not see you before you see them for though they have but a single eye among the three it is as sharp-sighted as half a dozen common eyes but what must i do asked perseus when we meet them quicksilver explained to perseus how the three grey women managed with their one eye they were in the habit it seems of changing it from one to another as if it had been a pair of spectacles or which would have suited them better a quizzing glass when one of the three had kept the eye a certain time she took it out of the socket and passed it to one of her sisters whose turn it might happen to be and who immediately clapped it into her own head and enjoyed a peep at the visible world thus it will be easily understood that only one of the three grey women could see while the other two were in utter darkness and moreover at the instant when the eye was passing from hand to hand neither of the poor old ladies was able to see a wink i have heard a great many strange things in my day and have witnessed not a few but none it seems to me that can compare with the oddity of these three grey women all peeping through a single eye so thought perseus likewise and was so astonished that he almost fancied his companion was joking with him and that there were no such old women in the world you will soon find whether i tell the truth or no observed quicksilver hark hush hist hist there they come now perseus looked earnestly through the dusk of the evening and there sure enough at no great distance off he descried the three grey women the light being so faint he could not well make out what sort of figures they were only he discovered that they had long grey hair and as they came nearer he saw that two of them had but the empty sockets of an eye in the middle of their foreheads but in the middle of the third sister's forehead there was a very large bright and piercing eye which sparkled like a great diamond in a ring and so penetrating did it seem to be that perseus could not help thinking it must possess the gift of seeing in the darkest midnight just as perfectly as at noonday the sight of three persons eyes was melted and collected into that single one thus the three old dames got along about as comfortably upon the whole as if they could all see at once she who chanced to have the eye in her forehead led the other two by the hands peeping sharply about her all the while insomuch that perseus dreaded lest she should see right through the thick clump of bushes behind which he and quicksilver had hidden themselves my stars it was positively terrible to be within reach of so very sharp an eye but before they reached the clump of bushes one of the three grey women spoke sister sister scarecrow cried she you have had the eye long enough it is my turn now let me keep it a moment longer sister nightmare answered scarecrow i thought i had a glimpse of something behind that thick bush well and what of that retorted nightmare peevishly 
can't i see into a thick bush as easily as yourself the eye is mine as well as yours and i know the use of it as well as you or maybe a little better i insist upon taking a peep immediately but here the third sister whose name was shake joint began to complain and said that it was her turn to have the eye and that scarecrow and nightmare wanted to keep it all to themselves to end the dispute old dame scarecrow took the eye out of her forehead and held it forth in her hand take it one of you cried she and quit this foolish quarrelling for my part i shall be glad of a little thick darkness take it quickly however or i must clap it into my own head again accordingly both nightmare and shake joint put out their hands groping eagerly to snatch the eye out of the hand of scarecrow but being both alike blind they could not easily find where scarecrow's hand was and scarecrow being now just as much in the dark as shake joint and nightmare could not at once meet either of their hands in order to put the eye into it thus as you will see with half an eye my wise little auditors these good old dames had fallen into a strange perplexity for though the eye shone and glistened like a star as scarecrow held it out yet the grey women caught not the least glimpse of its light and were all three in utter darkness from too impatient a desire to see quicksilver was so much tickled at beholding shake joint and nightmare both groping for the eye and each finding fault with scarecrow and one another that he could scarcely help laughing aloud now is your time he whispered to perseus quick quick before they can clap the eye into either of their heads rush out upon the old ladies and snatch it from scarecrow's hand in an instant while the three grey women were still scolding each other perseus leaped from behind the clump of bushes and made himself master of the prize the marvellous eye as he held it in his hand shone very brightly and seemed to look up into his face with a knowing air and an expression as if it would have winked had it been provided with a pair of eyelids for that purpose but the grey women knew nothing of what had happened and each supposing that one of her sisters was in possession of the eye they began their quarrel anew at last as perseus did not wish to put these respectable dames to greater inconvenience than was really necessary he thought it right to explain the matter my good ladies said he pray do not be angry with one another if anybody is in fault it is myself for i have the honour to hold your very brilliant and excellent eye in my own hand you you have our eye and who are you screamed the three grey women all in a breath for they were terribly frightened of course at hearing a strange voice and discovering that their eyesight had got into the hands of they could not guess whom oh what shall we do sisters what shall we do we're all in the dark give us our eye give us our one precious solitary eye you have two of your own give us our eye End of section two section three of a wonder book for girls and boys this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a wonder book for girls and boys by nathaniel hawthorne the gorgon's head part two tell them whispered quicksilver to perseus that they shall have back the eye as soon as they direct you where to find the nymphs who have the flying slippers the magic wallet and the helmet of darkness my dear good admirable old ladies said perseus addressing the grey women there is no occasion for putting yourself in such a fright i am by no means a bad young man you shall have back your eye safe and sound and as bright as ever the moment you tell me where to find the nymphs the nymphs goodness me sisters what nymphs does he mean screamed scarecrow there are a great many nymphs people say 
some that go a hunting in the woods some that live inside of trees and some that have a comfortable home in fountains of water we know nothing at all about them we are three unfortunate old souls that go wandering about in the dusk and never had but one eye amongst us and that one you have stolen away oh give it back good stranger whoever you are give it back all this while the three grey women were groping with their outstretched hands and trying their utmost to get hold of perseus but he took good care to keep out of their reach my respectable dames said he for his mother had taught him always to use the greatest civility i hold your eye fast in my hand and shall keep it safely for you until you please to tell me where to find these nymphs the nymphs i mean who keep the enchanted wallet the flying slippers and the what is it the helmet of invisibility mercy on us sisters what is the young man talking about exclaimed scarecrow nightmare and shake joint one to another with great appearance of astonishment a pair of flying slippers quoth he his heels would quickly fly higher than his head if he were silly enough to put them on and a helmet of invisibility how could a helmet make him invisible unless it were big enough for him to hide under it and an enchanted wallet what sort of contrivance may that be i wonder no no good stranger we can tell you nothing of these marvellous things you have two eyes of your own and we have but a single one among us three you can find out such wonders better than three blind old creatures like us perseus hearing them talk in this way began really to think that the grey women knew nothing of the matter and as it grieved him to have put them to so much trouble he was just on the point of restoring their eye and asking pardon for his rudeness in snatching it away but quicksilver caught his hand don't let them make a fool of you said he these three grey women are the only persons in the world that can tell you where to find the nymphs and unless you get that information you will never succeed in cutting off the head of medusa with the snaky locks keep fast hold of the eye and all will go well as it turned out quicksilver was in the right there are but few things that people prize so much as they do their eyesight and the grey women valued their single eye as highly as if it had been half a dozen which was the number they ought to have had finding that there was no other way of recovering it they at last told perseus what he wanted to know and no sooner had they done so than he immediately and with the utmost respect clapped the eye into the vacant socket in one of their foreheads thanked them for their kindness and bade them farewell before the young man was out of hearing however they had got into a new dispute because he happened to have given the eye to scarecrow who had already taken her turn of it when their trouble with perseus commenced it is greatly to be feared that the three grey women were very much in the habit of disturbing their mutual harmony by bickerings of this sort which was the more pity as they could not conveniently do without one another and were evidently intended to be inseparable companions as a general rule i would advise all people whether sisters or brothers old or young who chance to have but one eye amongst them to cultivate forbearance and not at all insist upon peeping through it at once quicksilver and perseus in the meantime were making the best of their way in quest of the nymphs the old dames had given them such particular directions that they were not long in finding them out they proved to be very different persons from nightmare shake joint and scarecrow for instead of being old they were young and beautiful and instead of one eye amongst the sisterhood each nymph had two exceedingly bright eyes of her own with which she looked very kindly at perseus they seemed to be acquainted with quicksilver and when he told them the adventure which perseus had undertaken they made no difficulty about giving him the valuable articles that were in their custody in the first place they brought out what appeared to be a small purse made of deer skin and curiously embroidered and bade him to be sure and keep it safe this was the magic wallet 
the nymphs next produced a pair of shoes or slippers or sandals with a nice little pair of wings at the heel of each put them on perseus said quicksilver you will find yourself as light-heeled as you can desire for the remainder of our journey and so perseus proceeded to put one of the slippers on while he laid the other one on the ground by his side unexpectedly however this other slipper spread its wings fluttered up off the ground and would probably have flown away if quicksilver had not made a leap and luckily caught it in the air be more careful said he as he gave it back to perseus it would frighten the birds up aloft if they should see a flying slipper amongst them when perseus had got on both of these wonderful slippers he was altogether too buoyant to tread on earth making a step or two lo and behold upward he popped into the air high above the heads of quicksilver and the nymphs and found it very difficult to clamber down again winged slippers and all such high-flying contrivances are seldom quite easy to manage until one grows a little accustomed to them quicksilver laughed at his companion's involuntary activity and told him that he must not be in so desperate a hurry but must wait for the invisible helmet the good-natured nymphs had the helmet with its dark tuft of waving plumes all in readiness to put upon his head and now there happened about as wonderful an incident as anything that i have yet told you the instant before the helmet was put on there stood perseus a beautiful young man with golden ringlets and rosy cheeks the crooked sword by his side and the brightly polished shield upon his arm a figure that seemed all made up of courage sprightliness and glorious light but when the helmet had descended over his white brow there was no longer any perseus to be seen nothing but empty air even the helmet that covered him with its invisibility had vanished where are you perseus asked quicksilver why here to be sure answered perseus very quietly although his voice seemed to come out of the transparent atmosphere just where i was a moment ago don't you see me no indeed answered his friend you are hidden under the helmet but if i cannot see you neither can the gorgons follow me therefore and we will try your dexterity in using the winged slippers with these words quicksilver's cap spread its wings as if his head were about to fly away from his shoulders but his whole figure rose lightly into the air and perseus followed by the time they had ascended a few hundred feet the young man began to feel what a delightful thing it was to leave the dull earth so far beneath him and to be able to flit about like a bird it was now deep night perseus looked upward and saw the round bright silvery moon and thought that he should desire nothing better than to soar up thither and spend his life there and then he looked downward again and saw the earth with its seas and lakes and the silver courses of its rivers and its snowy mountain peaks and the breadth of its fields and the dark cluster of its woods and its cities of white marble and with the moonshine sleeping over the whole scene it was as beautiful as the moon or any star could be and among other objects he saw the island of seraphis where his dear mother was sometimes he and quicksilver approached a cloud that at a distance looked as if it were made of fleecy silver although when they plunged into it they found themselves chilled and moistened with grey mist so swift was their flight however that in an instant they emerged from the cloud into the moonlight again once a high soaring eagle flew right against the invisible perseus the bravest sights were the meteors that gleamed suddenly out as if a bonfire had been kindled in the sky and made the moon shine pale for as much as a hundred miles around them as the two companions flew onward perseus fancied that he could hear the rustle of a garment close by his side and it was on the side opposite to the one where he beheld quicksilver and yet only quicksilver was visible whose garment is this inquired perseus that keeps rustling close beside me in the breeze oh it's my sister's 
answered quicksilver she's coming along with us as i told you she would we can do nothing without the help of my sister you have no idea how wise she is she has such eyes too why she can see you at this moment just as distinctly as if you were not invisible and i'll venture to say she will be the first to discover the gorgons by this time in their swift voyage through the air they had come within sight of the great ocean and were soon flying over it far beneath them the waves tossed themselves tumultuously in mid-sea or rolled a white surf-line along the long beaches or foamed against the rocky cliffs with a roar that was thunderous in the lower world although it became a gentle murmur like the voice of a baby half asleep before it reached the ears of perseus just then a voice spoke in the air close by him it seemed to be a woman's voice and was melodious though not exactly what might be called sweet but grave and mild perseus said the voice there are the gorgons where exclaimed perseus i cannot see them on the shore of that island beneath you replied the voice a pebble dropped from your hand would strike in the midst of them i told you she'd be the first to discover them said quicksilver to perseus and there they are straight downward two or three thousand feet below him perseus perceived a small island with the sea breaking into white foam all around its rocky shore except on one side where there was a beach of snowy sand he descended towards it and looking earnestly at a cluster or heap of brightness at the foot of a precipice of black rocks behold there were the terrible gorgons they lay fast asleep soothed by the thunder of the sea for it required a tumult that would have deafened everybody else to lull such fierce creatures into slumber the moonlight glistened on their steely scales and on their golden wings which drooped idly over the sand their brazen claws horrible to look at were thrust out and clutched the wave-beaten fragments of rock while the sleeping gorgons dreamed of tearing some poor mortal all to pieces the snakes that served them instead of hair seemed likewise to be asleep although now and then one would writhe and lift its head and thrust out its forked tongue emitting a drowsy hiss and then let itself subside among its sister snakes the gorgons were more like an awful gigantic kind of insect immense golden-winged beetles or dragonflies or something of that sort at once ugly and beautiful then like anything else only that they were a thousand and a million times as big and with all this there was something partly human about them too luckily for perseus their faces were completely hidden from him by the posture in which they lay for had he but looked one instant at them he would have fallen heavily out of the air an image of senseless stone now whispered quicksilver as he hovered by the side of perseus now is your time to do the deed be quick for if one of the gorgons should awake you are too late which shall i strike at asked perseus drawing his sword and descending a little lower they all three look alike all three have snaky locks which of the three is medusa it must be understood that medusa was the only one of these dragon monsters whose head perseus could possibly cut off as for the other two let him have the sharpest sword that ever was forged and he might have hacked away by the hour together without doing them the least harm be cautious said the calm voice which had before spoken to him one of the gorgons is stirring in her sleep and is just about to turn over that is medusa do not look at her the sight would turn you to stone look at the reflection of her face and figure in the bright mirror of your shield perseus now understood quicksilver's motive for so earnestly exhorting him to polish his shield in its surface he could safely look at the reflection of the gorgon's face and there it was that terrible countenance mirrored in the brightness of the shield with the moonlight falling over it and displaying all its horror the snakes whose venomous natures could not altogether sleep 
kept twisting themselves over the forehead it was the fiercest and most horrible face that ever was seen or imagined and yet with a strange fearful and savage kind of beauty in it the eyes were closed and the gorgon was still in a deep slumber but there was an unquiet expression disturbing her features as if the monster was troubled with an ugly dream she gnashed her white tusks and dug into the sand with her brazen claws the snakes too seemed to feel medusa's dream and to be made more restless by it they twined themselves into tumultuous knots writhed fiercely and uplifted a hundred hissing heads without opening their eyes now now whispered quicksilver who was growing impatient make a dash at the monster but be calm said the grave melodious voice at the young man's side look in your shield as you fly downward and take care that you do not miss your first stroke perseus flew cautiously downward still keeping his eyes on medusa's face as reflected in his shield the nearer he came the more terrible did the snaky visage and metallic body of the monster grow at last when he found himself hovering over her within arm's length perseus uplifted his sword while at the same instant each separate snake upon the gorgon's head stretched threateningly upward and medusa unclosed her eyes but she awoke too late the sword was sharp the stroke fell like a lightning flash and the head of the wicked medusa tumbled from her body admirably done cried quicksilver make haste and clap the head into your magic wallet to the astonishment of perseus the small embroidered wallet which had hung about his neck and which had hitherto been no bigger than a purse grew all at once large enough to contain medusa's head as quick as thought he snatched it up with the snake still writhing upon it and thrust it in your task is done said the calm voice now fly for the other gorgons will do their utmost to take vengeance for medusa's death it was indeed necessary to take flight for perseus had not done the deed so quietly but that the clash of his sword and the hissing of the snakes and the thump of medusa's head as it tumbled upon the sea-beaten sand awoke the other two monsters there they sat for an instant sleepily rubbing their eyes with their brazen fingers while all the snakes on their heads reared themselves on end with surprise and with venomous malice against they knew not what but when the gorgon saw the scaly carcass of medusa headless and her golden wings all ruffled and half spread out on the sand it was really awful to hear what yells and screeches they set up and then the snakes they sent forth a hundredfold hiss with one consent and medusa's snakes answered them out of the magic wallet no sooner were the gorgons brought awake than they hurtled upward into the air brandishing their brass talons gnashing their horrible tusks and flapping their huge wings so wildly that some of the golden feathers were shaken out and floated down upon the shore and there perhaps these very feathers lie scattered till this day up rose the gorgons as i tell you staring horribly about in hopes of turning somebody to stone had perseus looked them in the face or had he fallen into their clutches his poor mother would never have kissed her boy again but he took good care to turn his eyes another way and as he wore the helmet of invisibility the gorgons knew not in what direction to follow him nor did he fail to make the best use of the winged slippers by soaring upwards a perpendicular mile or so at that height when the screams of those abominable creatures sounded faintly beneath him he made straight course for the island of seraphus in order to carry medusa's head to king polydectes i have no time to tell you of several marvellous things that befell perseus on his way homeward such as his killing a hideous sea monster just as it was on the point of devouring a beautiful maiden nor how he changed an enormous giant into a mountain of stone merely by showing him the head of the gorgon if you doubt this latter story 
you may make a voyage to africa some day or other and see the very mountain which is still known by the ancient giant's name finally our brave perseus arrived at the island where he expected to see his dear mother but during his absence the wicked king had treated danae so very ill that she was compelled to make her escape and had taken refuge in a temple where some good old priests were extremely kind to her these praiseworthy priests and the kind-hearted fisherman who had first shown hospitality to danae and little perseus when he found them afloat in the chest seemed to have been the only persons on the island who cared about doing right all the rest of the people as well as king polydectes himself were remarkably ill-behaved and deserved no better destiny than that which was now to happen not finding his mother at home perseus went straight to the palace and was immediately ushered into the presence of the king polydectes was by no means rejoiced to see him for he had felt almost certain in his own evil mind that the gorgons would have torn the poor young man to pieces and have eaten him up out of the way however seeing him safely returned he put the best face he could upon the matter and asked perseus how he had succeeded have you performed your promise inquired he have you brought me the head of medusa with the snaky locks if not young man it will cost you dear or i must have a bridal present for the beautiful princess hippodamia and there is nothing else that she would admire so much yes please your majesty answered perseus in a quiet way as if it were no very wonderful deed for such a young man as he to perform i have brought you the gorgon's head snaky locks and all indeed pray let me see it quoth king polydectes it must be a very curious spectacle if all that travellers tell about it be true your majesty is in the right replied perseus it is really an object that will be pretty certain to fix the regards of all who look at it and if your majesty think fit i would suggest that a holiday be proclaimed and that all your majesty's subjects be summoned to behold this wonderful curiosity few of them i imagine have seen a gorgon's head before and perhaps never may again well, the king well knew that his subjects were an idle set of reprobates and very fond of sight-seeing as idle persons usually are so he took the young man's advice and sent out heralds and messengers in all directions to blow the trumpet at the street corners and in the market-places and wherever two roads met and summon everybody to court thither accordingly came a great multitude of good-for-nothing vagabonds all of whom out of pure love of mischief would have been glad if perseus had met some ill hap in his encounter with the gorgons if there were any better people in the island as i really hope there may have been although the story tells nothing about any such they stayed quietly at home minding their business and taking care of their little children most of the inhabitants at all events ran as fast as they could to the palace and shoved and pushed and elbowed one another in their eagerness to get near a balcony on which perseus showed himself holding the embroidered wallet in his hand on a platform within full view of the balcony sat the mighty king polydectes amid his evil counsellors and with his flattering courtiers in a semicircle round about him monarch counsellors courtiers and subjects all gazed eagerly towards perseus show us the head show us the head shouted the people and there was a fierceness in their cry as if they would tear perseus to pieces unless he should satisfy them with what he had to show show us the head of medusa with the snaky locks a feeling of sorrow and pity came over the youthful perseus o oh, king polydectes cried he and ye many people i am very loath to show you the gorgon's head ah the villain and coward yelled the people more fiercely than before he is making game of us he has no gorgon's head show us the head if you have it or we will take your own head for a football 
the evil counsellors whispered bad advice in the king's ear the courtiers murmured with one consent that perseus had shown disrespect to their royal lord and master and the great king polydectes himself waved his hand and ordered him with a stern deep voice of authority on his peril to produce the head show me the gorgon's head or i will cut off your own and perseus sighed this instant repeated polydectes or you die behold it then cried perseus in a voice like the blast of a trumpet and suddenly holding up the head not an eyelid had time to wink before the wicked king polydectes his evil counsellors and all his fierce subjects were no longer anything but the mere images of a monarch and his people they were all fixed forever in the look and attitude of that moment at the first glimpse of the terrible head of medusa they whitened into marble and perseus thrust the head back into his wallet and went to tell his dear mother that she need no longer be afraid of the wicked king polydectes end of section three section four of a wonder book for girls and boys this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a wonder book for girls and boys by nathaniel hawthorne after the story of the gorgon's head was not that a very fine story asked eustace oh yes yes cried cowslip clapping her hands and those funny old women with only one eye amongst them i never heard of anything so strange as to their one tooth which they shifted about observed primrose there was nothing so very wonderful in that i suppose it was a false tooth but think of your turning mercury into quicksilver and talking about his sister you are too ridiculous and was she not his sister asked eustace bright if i had thought of it sooner i would have described her as a maiden lady who kept a pet owl well at any rate said primrose your story seems to have driven away the mist and indeed while the tale was going forward the vapours had been quite exhaled from the landscape a scene was now disclosed which the spectators might almost fancy as having been created since they had last looked in the direction where it lay about half a mile distant in the lap of the valley now appeared a beautiful lake which reflected a perfect image of its own wooded banks and of the summits of the more distant hills it gleamed in glassy tranquillity without the trace of a winged breeze on any part of its bosom beyond its farther shore was monument mountain in a recumbent position stretching almost across the valley eustace bright compared it to a huge headless sphinx wrapped in a persian shawl and indeed so rich and diversified was the autumnal foliage of its woods that the simile of the shawl was by no means too high coloured for the reality in the lower ground between tanglewood and the lake the clumps of trees and borders of woodland were chiefly golden-leaved or dusky brown as having suffered more from frost than the foliage on the hillsides over all this scene there was a genial sunshine intermingled with a slight haze which made it unspeakably soft and tender oh what a day of indian summer was it going to be the children snatched their baskets and set forth with hop skip and jump and all sorts of frisks and gambols while cousin eustace proved his fitness to preside over the party by outdoing all their antics and performing several new capers which none of them could ever hope to imitate behind went a good old dog whose name was ben he was one of the most respectable and kind-hearted of quadrupeds and probably felt it to be his duty not to trust the children away from their parents without some better guardian than this feather-brained eustace bright 
End of section four. Section five of A Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Wonder Book for Boys and Girls by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Section five. Introductory to the Golden Touch. At noon, our juvenile party assembled in a dell through the depths of which ran a little brook the dell was narrow and its steep sides from the margin of the stream upward were thickly set with trees chiefly walnuts and chestnuts among which grew a few oaks and maples in the summer time the shade of so many clustering branches meeting and intermingling across the rivulet was deep enough to produce a noontide twilight hence came the name of shadow brook but now ever since autumn had crept into this secluded place all the dark verdure was changed to gold so that it really kindled up the dell instead of shading it the bright yellow leaves even had it been a cloudy day would have seemed to keep the sunlight among them and enough of them had fallen to strew all the bed and margin of the brook with sunlight too thus the shady nook where summer had cooled herself was now the sunniest spot anywhere to be found the little brook ran along over its pathway of gold here pausing to form a pool in which the minnows were darting to and fro and then it hurried onward at a swifter pace as if in haste to reach the lake and forgetting to look whither it went it tumbled over the root of a tree which stretched quite across its current. You would have laughed to hear how noisily it babbled about this accident. And even after it had run onward, the brook still kept talking to itself as if it were in a maze. It was wonder-smitten, I suppose, at finding its dark dell so illuminated, and at hearing the prattle and merriment of so many children. So it stole away as quickly as it could, and hid itself in the lake in the dell of shadow brook eustace bright and his little friends had eaten their dinner they had brought plenty of good things from tanglewood in their baskets and had spread them out on the stumps of trees and on mossy trunks and had feasted merrily and made a very nice dinner indeed after it was over nobody felt like stirring we will rest ourselves here said several of the children while cousin eustace tells us another of his pretty stories cousin eustace had a good right to be tired as well as the children for he had performed great feats on that memorable forenoon dandelion clover cowslip and buttercup were almost persuaded that he had winged slippers like those which the nymphs gave perseus so often had the student shown himself at the tip-top of a nut-tree when only a moment before he had been standing on the ground and then what showers of walnuts had he sent rattling down upon their heads for their busy little hands to gather into the baskets in short he had been as active as a squirrel or a monkey and now flinging himself down on the yellow leaves seemed inclined to take a little rest but children have no mercy nor consideration for anybody's weariness and if you had but a single breath left they would ask you to spend it in telling them a story cousin eustace said cowslip that was a very nice story of the gorgon's head do you think you could tell another as good yes child said eustace pulling the brim of his cap over his eyes as if preparing for a nap i can tell you a dozen as good or better if i choose oh primrose and periwinkle do you hear what he says cried cowslip dancing with delight cousin eustace is going to tell us a dozen better stories than that about the gorgon's head i did not promise you even one you foolish little cowslip said eustace half pettishly however i suppose you must have it 
this is the consequence of having earned a reputation i wish i were a great deal duller than i am or that i had never shown half the bright qualities with which nature has endowed me and then i might have my nap out in peace and comfort but cousin eustace as i think i have hinted before was as fond of telling his stories as the children of hearing them his mind was in a free and happy state and took delight in its own activity and scarcely required any external impulse to set it at work how different is this spontaneous play of the intellect from the trained diligence of maturer years when toil has perhaps grown easy by long habit and the day's work may have become essential to the day's comfort although the rest of the matter has bubbled away this remark however is not meant for the children to hear without further solicitation eustace bright proceeded to tell the following really splendid story it had come into his mind as he lay looking upward into the depths of a tree and observing how the touch of autumn had transmuted every one of its green leaves into what resembled the purest gold and this change which we have all of us witnessed is as wonderful as anything that eustace told about in the story of midas End of section five. section six of a wonder book for boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Wonder Book for Boys and Girls by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Section 6. The Golden Touch. Once upon a time there lived a very rich man, and a king besides, whose name was Midas. And he had a little daughter, whom nobody but myself ever heard of, and whose name I either never knew or have entirely forgotten. So, because I love odd names for little girls, I chose to call her Marigold. This King Midas was fonder of gold than of anything else in the world. He valued his royal crown chiefly because it was composed of that precious metal. If he loved anything better, or half as well, it was the one little maiden who played so merrily around her father's footstool. But the more Midas loved his daughter, the more did he desire and seek for wealth. He thought, foolish man, that the best thing he could possibly do for this dear child would be to bequeath her the immensest pile of yellow, glistening coin that had ever been heaped together since the world was made. Thus he gave all his thoughts and all his time to this one purpose if ever he happened to gaze for an instant at the gold-tinted clouds of sunset he wished that they were real gold and that they could be squeezed safely into his strong box when little marigold ran to meet him with a bunch of buttercups and dandelions he used to say pooh pooh child if these flowers were as golden as they look they would be worth the plucking and yet in his earlier days, before he was so entirely possessed of this insane desire for riches, King Midas had shown a great taste for flowers. He had planted a garden in which grew the biggest and beautifulest and sweetest roses that any mortal ever saw or smelt. These roses were still growing in the garden, as large, as lovely, and as fragrant as when Midas used to pass whole hours in gazing at them and inhaling their perfume but now if he looked at them at all it was only to calculate how much the garden would be worth if each of the innumerable rose petals were a thin plate of gold and though he was once fond of music in spite of an idle story about his ears which were said to resemble those of an ass the only music for poor midas now was the chink of one coin against another at length as people always grow more and more foolish unless they take care to grow wiser and wiser midas had got to be so exceedingly unreasonable that he could scarcely bear to see or touch any object 
that was not gold. He made it his custom, therefore, to pass a large portion of every day in a dark and dreary apartment, underground, at the basement of his palace. It was here that he kept his wealth. To this dismal hole, for it was little better than a dungeon, Midas betook himself whenever he wanted to be particularly happy. Here, after carefully locking the door, he would take a bag of gold coin, or a gold cup as big as a washbowl, or a heavy golden bar, or a peck measure of gold dust, and bring them from the obscure corners of the room into the one bright and narrow sunbeam that fell from the dungeon-like window. He valued the sunbeam for no other reason but that his treasure would not shine without its help. And then would he reckon over the coins in the bag, toss up the bar and catch it as it came down, sift the gold dust through his fingers, look at the funny image of his own face, as reflected in the burnished circumference of the cup, and whisper to himself, O oh, Midas, rich King Midas, what a happy man art thou! But it was laughable to see how the image of his face kept grinning at him, out of the polished surface of the cup. It seemed to be aware of his foolish behavior, and to have a naughty inclination to make fun of him. Midas called himself a happy man, but felt that he was not yet quite so happy as he might be. The very tip-top of enjoyment would never be reached, unless the whole world were to become his treasure-room and be filled with yellow metal which should be all his own now i need hardly remind such wise little people as you are that in the old old times when king midas was alive a great many things came to pass which we should consider wonderful if they were to happen in our own day and country and on the other hand a great many things take place nowadays which seem not only wonderful to us but at which the people of old times would have stared their eyes out. On the whole, I regard our own times as the strangest of the two, but, however that may be, I must go on with my story. Midas was enjoying himself in his treasure-room one day, as usual, when he perceived a shadow fall over the heaps of gold, and, looking suddenly up, what should he behold but the figure of a stranger, standing in the bright and narrow sunbeam. It was a young man, with a cheerful and ruddy face. Whether it was that the imagination of King Midas threw a yellow tinge over everything, or whatever the cause might be, he could not help fancying that the smile with which the stranger regarded him had a kind of golden radiance in it. Certainly, although his figure intercepted the sunshine, there was now a brighter gleam upon all the piled-up treasures than before. Even the remotest corners had their share of it, and were lighted up, when the stranger smiled, as with tips of flame and sparkles of fire. As Midas knew that he had carefully turned the key in the lock, and that no mortal strength could possibly break into his treasure-room, he, of course, concluded that his visitor must be something more than mortal. It is no matter about telling you who he was. In those days, when the earth was comparatively a new affair, it was supposed to be often the resort of beings endowed with supernatural power, and who used to interest themselves in the joys and sorrows of men, women, and children, half playfully and half seriously. Midas had met such beings before now, and was not sorry to meet one of them again. The stranger's aspect, indeed, was so good-humoured and kindly, if not beneficent, that it would have been unreasonable to suspect him of intending any mischief. It was far more probable that he came to do Midas a favour. And what could that favour be, unless to multiply his heaps of treasure? The stranger gazed about the room, and when his lustrous smile had glistened upon all the golden objects that were there, he turned again to Midas. "'You are a wealthy man, friend Midas,' he observed. "'I doubt whether any other four walls on earth contain so much gold as you have contrived to pile up in this room.' "'I have done pretty well, pretty well,' answered Midas, in a discontented tone. "'But after all, it is but a trifle.' 
when you consider that it has taken me my whole life to get it together if one could live a thousand years he might have time to grow rich what exclaimed the stranger then you are not satisfied midas shook his head and pray what would satisfy you asked the stranger merely for the curiosity of the thing i should be glad to know midas paused and meditated he felt a presentiment that this stranger with such a golden lustre in his good-humoured smile had come hither with both the power and the purpose of gratifying his utmost wishes now therefore was the fortunate moment when he had but to speak and obtain whatever possible or seemingly impossible thing it might come into his head to ask so he thought and thought and thought and heaped up one golden mountain upon another in his imagination without being able to imagine them big enough at last a bright idea occurred to king midas it seemed really as bright as the glistening metal which he loved so much raising his head he looked the lustrous stranger in the face well midas observed his visitor i see that you have at length hit upon something that will satisfy you tell me your wish it is only this replied midas i am weary of collecting my treasures with so much trouble and beholding the heap so diminutive after i have done my best i wish everything that i touch to be changed to gold the stranger's smile grew so very broad that it seemed to fill the room like an outburst of the sun gleaming into a shadowy dell where the yellow autumnal leaves for so looked the lumps and particles of gold lie strewn in the glow of light the golden touch exclaimed he you certainly deserve credit friend midas for striking out so brilliant a conception but are you quite sure that this will satisfy you how could it fail said midas and will you never regret the possession of it what could induce me asked midas i ask nothing else to render me perfectly happy be it as you wish then replied the stranger waving his hand in token of farewell to-morrow at sunrise you will find yourself gifted with the golden touch the figure of the stranger then became exceedingly bright and midas involuntarily closed his eyes on opening them again he beheld only one yellow sunbeam in the room and all around him the glistening of the precious metal which he had spent his life in hoarding up whether midas slept as usual that night the story does not say asleep or awake however his mind was probably in the state of a child's to whom a beautiful new plaything has been promised in the morning at any rate day had hardly peeped over the hills when king midas was broad awake and stretching his arms out of bed began to touch the objects that were within reach he was anxious to prove whether the golden touch had really come according to the stranger's promise so he laid his finger on a chair by the bedside and on various other things but was grievously disappointed to perceive that they remained of exactly the same substance as before indeed he felt very much afraid that he had only dreamed about the lustrous stranger or else that the latter had been making game of him and what a miserable affair would it be if after all his hopes midas must content himself with what little gold he could scrape together by ordinary means instead of creating it by a touch all this while it was only the grey of the morning but with a streak of brightness along the edge of the sky where midas could not see it he lay in a very disconsolate mood regretting the downfall of his hopes and kept growing sadder and sadder until the earliest sunbeam shone through the window and gilded the ceiling over his head it seemed to midas that this bright yellow sunbeam was reflected in rather a singular way on the white covering of the bed looking more closely what was his astonishment and delight when he found that this linen fabric had been transmuted to what seemed a woven texture of the purest and brightest gold the golden touch had come to him with the first sunbeam midas started up in a kind of joyful frenzy and ran about the room grasping at everything that happened to be in his way 
he seized one of the bedposts, and it became immediately a fluted golden pillar. He pulled aside a window curtain, in order to admit a clear spectacle of the wonders which he was performing, and the tassel grew heavy in his hand, a mass of gold. He took up a book from the table. At his first touch it assumed the appearance of such a splendidly bound and gilt-edged volume as one often meets with nowadays. But on running his fingers through the leaves, behold, it was a bundle of thin golden plates, in which all the wisdom of the book had grown illegible. He hurriedly put on his clothes, and was enraptured to see himself in a magnificent suit of gold cloth, which retained its flexibility and softness, although it burdened him a little with its weight. He drew out his handkerchief, which little Marigold had hemmed for him, that was likewise gold, with the dear child's neat and pretty stitches running all along the border in gold thread. Somehow or other, this last transformation did not quite please King Midas. He would rather that his little daughter's handiwork should have remained just the same as when she climbed his knee and put it into his hand. But it was not worth while to vex himself about a trifle. Midas now took his spectacles from his pocket and put them on his nose, in order that he might see more distinctly what he was about. In those days spectacles for common people had not been invented, but were already worn by kings, else how could Midas have had any? To his great perplexity, however, excellent as the glasses were, he discovered that he could not possibly see through them. But this was the most natural thing in the world, for on taking them off, the transparent crystal turned out to be plates of yellow metal, and of course were worthless as spectacles, though valuable as gold. It struck Midas as rather inconvenient that, with all his wealth, he could never again be rich enough to own a pair of serviceable spectacles. It is no great matter, nevertheless, said he to himself, very philosophically. We cannot expect any great good without its being accompanied with some small inconvenience. The golden touch is worth the sacrifice of a pair of spectacles, at least, if not of one's very eyesight. My own eyes will serve for ordinary purposes, and little Marigold will soon be old enough to read to me. Wise King Midas was so exalted by his good fortune that the palace seemed not sufficiently spacious to contain him. He therefore went downstairs and smiled on observing that the balustrade of the staircase became a bar of burnished gold as his hand passed over it in his descent. He lifted the door latch. It was brass only a moment ago, but golden when his fingers quitted it, and emerged into the garden. Here, as it happened, he found a great number of beautiful roses in full bloom, and others in all the stages of lovely bud and blossom. Very delicious was their fragrance in the morning breeze. Their delicate blush was one of the fairest sights in the world, so gentle, so modest, and so full of sweet tranquillity, did these roses seem to be. But Midas knew a way to make them far more precious, according to his way of thinking, than roses had ever been before. So he took great pains in going from bush to bush, and exercised his magic touch most indefatigably, until every individual flower and bud, and even the worms at the heart of some of them, were changed to gold. By the time this good work was completed, King Midas was summoned to breakfast, and as the morning air had given him an excellent appetite, he made haste back to the palace. What was usually a king's breakfast in the days of Midas, I really do not know, and cannot stop now to investigate. To the best of my belief, however, on this particular morning, the breakfast consisted of hot cakes, some nice little brook trout, roasted potatoes, fresh-boiled eggs, and coffee for King Midas himself, and a bowl of bread and milk for his daughter Marigold. At all events, this is a breakfast fit to set before a king, and whether he had it or not, King Midas could not have had a better. Little Marigold had not yet made her appearance. Her father ordered her to be called, and, seating himself at table, awaited the child's coming, in order to begin his own breakfast. 
to do midas justice he really loved his daughter and loved her so much the more this morning on account of the good fortune which had befallen him it was not a great while before he heard her coming along the passageway crying bitterly this circumstance surprised him because marigold was one of the cheerfullest little people whom you could see in a summer's day and hardly shed a thimbleful of tears in a twelvemonth when midas heard her sobs he determined to put little marigold into better spirits by an agreeable surprise so leaning across the table he touched his daughter's bowl which was a china one with pretty figures all around it and transmuted it to gleaming gold meanwhile marigold slowly and disconsolately opened the door and showed herself with her apron at her eyes still sobbing as if her heart would break how now my little lady cried midas pray what is the matter with you this bright morning marigold without taking the apron from her eyes held out her hand in which was one of the roses which midas had so recently transmuted beautiful exclaimed her father and what is there in this magnificent golden rose to make you cry oh dear father answered the child as well as her sobs would let her it is not beautiful but the ugliest flower that ever grew as soon as i was dressed i ran into the garden to gather some roses for you because i know you like them and like them the better when gathered by your little daughter but oh dear dear me what do you think has happened such a misfortune all the beautiful roses that smelled so sweetly and had so many lovely blushes are blighted and spoilt they are grown quite yellow as you see this one and have no longer any fragrance what can have been the matter with them pooh my dear little girl pray don't cry about it said midas who was ashamed to confess that he himself had wrought the change which so greatly afflicted her sit down and eat your bread and milk you will find it easy enough to exchange a golden rose like that which will last hundreds of years for an ordinary one which would wither in a day i don't care for such roses as this cried marigold tossing it contemptuously away it has no smell and the hard petals prick my nose the child now sat down to table but was so occupied with her grief for the blighted roses that she did not even notice the wonderful transmutation of her china bowl perhaps this was all the better for marigold was accustomed to take pleasure in looking at the queer figures and strange trees and houses that were painted on the circumference of the bowl and these ornaments were now entirely lost in the golden hue of the metal midas meanwhile had poured out a cup of coffee and as a matter of course the coffee-pot whatever metal it may have been when he took it up was gold when he set it down he thought to himself that it was rather an extravagant style of splendour in a king of his simple habits to breakfast off a service of gold and began to be puzzled with the difficulty of keeping his treasures safe the cupboard and the kitchen would no longer be a secure place of deposit for articles so valuable as golden bowls and coffee-pots amid these thoughts he lifted a spoonful of coffee to his lips and sipping it was astonished to perceive that the instant his lips touched the liquid it became molten gold and the next moment hardened into a lump ha exclaimed midas rather aghast what is the matter father asked little marigold gazing at him with the tears still standing in her eyes nothing child nothing said midas eat your milk before it gets quite cold he took one of the nice little trouts on his plate and by way of experiment touched its tail with his finger to his horror it was immediately transmuted from an admirably fried brook trout into a goldfish though not one of those goldfishes which people often keep in glass globes as ornaments for the parlour no but it was really a metallic fish and looked as if it had been very cunningly made by the nicest goldsmith in the world its little bones were now golden wires its fins and tails were thin plates of gold and there were the marks of the fork in it and all the delicate frothy appearance of a nicely fried fish exactly imitated in metal 
a very pretty piece of work as you may suppose only king midas just at that moment would much rather have had a real trout in his dish than this elaborate and valuable imitation of one i don't quite see thought he to himself how i am to get any breakfast he took one of the smoking hot cakes and had scarcely broken it when to his cruel mortification though a moment before it had been of the whitest wheat it assumed the yellow hue of indian meal to say the truth if it had really been a hot indian cake midas would have prized it a good deal more than he did now when its solidity and increased weight made him too bitterly sensible that it was gold almost in despair he helped himself to a boiled egg which immediately underwent a change similar to those of the trout and the cake the egg indeed might have been mistaken for one of those the famous goose in the story-book was in the habit of laying but king midas was the only goose that had anything to do with the matter well this is a quandary thought he leaning back in his chair and looking quite enviously at little marigold who was now eating her bread and milk with great satisfaction such a costly breakfast before me and nothing that can be eaten hoping that by dint of great dispatch he might avoid what he now felt to be a considerable inconvenience king midas next snatched a hot potato and attempted to cram it into his mouth and swallow it in a hurry but the golden touch was too nimble for him he found his mouth full not of mealy potato but of solid metal which so burnt his tongue that he roared aloud and jumping up from the table began to dance and stamp about the room both with pain and affright father dear father cried little marigold who was a very affectionate child pray what is the matter have you burnt your mouth ah dear child groaned midas dolefully i don't know what is to become of your poor father and truly my dear little folks did you ever hear of such a pitiable case in all your lives here was literally the richest breakfast that could be set before a king and its very richness made it absolutely good for nothing the poorest laborer sitting down to his crust of bread and cup of water was far better off than king midas whose delicate food was really worth its weight in gold and what was to be done already at breakfast midas was excessively hungry would he be less so by dinner-time and how ravenous would be his appetite for supper which must undoubtedly consist of the same sort of indigestible dishes as those now before him how many days think you would he survive a continuance of this rich fare these reflections so troubled wise king midas that he began to doubt whether after all riches are the one desirable thing in the world or even the most desirable but this was only a passing thought so fascinated was midas with the glitter of the yellow metal that he would still have refused to give up the golden touch for so paltry a consideration as a breakfast just imagine what a price for one meal's victuals it would have been the same as paying millions and millions of money and as many millions more as would take forever to reckon up for some fried trout an egg a potato a hot cake and a cup of coffee it would be quite too dear thought midas nevertheless so great was his hunger and the perplexity of his situation that he again groaned aloud and very grievously too our pretty marigold could endure it no longer she sat a moment gazing at her father and trying with all the might of her little wits to find out what was the matter with him then with a sweet and sorrowful impulse to comfort him she started from her chair and running to midas threw her arms affectionately about his knees he bent down and kissed her he felt that his little daughter's love was worth a thousand times more than he had gained by the golden touch my precious precious marigold cried he but marigold gave no answer alas what had he done how fatal was the gift which the stranger bestowed the moment the lips of midas touched marigold's forehead a change had taken place her sweet rosy face 
so full of affection as it had been, assumed a glittering yellow color, with yellow teardrops congealed on her cheeks. Her beautiful brown ringlets took the same tint. Her soft and tender little form grew hard and inflexible within her father's encircling arms. Oh, terrible misfortune! The victim of his insatiable desire for wealth, little Marigold was a human child no longer, but a golden statue. Yes, there she was, with the questioning look of love, grief, and pity hardened into her face. It was the prettiest and most woeful sight that mortal ever saw. All the features and tokens of Marigold were there. Even the beloved little dimple remained in her golden chin. But the more perfect was the resemblance, the greater was the father's agony at beholding this golden image, which was all that was left him of a daughter. It had been a favorite phrase of Midas, whenever he felt particularly fond of the child, to say that she was worth her weight in gold. And now the phrase had become literally true. And now, at last, when it was too late, he felt how infinitely a warm and tender heart that loved him exceeded in value all the wealth that could be piled up betwixt the earth and sky. It would be too sad a story if I were to tell you how Midas, in the fullness of all his gratified desires, began to wring his hands and bemoan himself, and how he could neither bear to look at Marigold nor yet to look away from her, except when his eyes were fixed on the image he could not possibly believe that she was changed to gold. But stealing another glance, there was the precious little figure with a yellow teardrop on its yellow cheek, and a look so piteous and tender that it seemed as if that very expression must needs soften the gold and make it flesh again. This, however, could not be. So Midas had only to wring his hands and to wish that he were the poorest man in the wide world if the loss of all his wealth might bring back the faintest rose-color to his dear child's face. While he was in this tumult of despair, he suddenly beheld a stranger standing near the door. Midas bent down his head without speaking, for he recognized the same figure which had appeared to him the day before in the treasure-room, and had bestowed on him this disastrous faculty of the golden touch. The stranger's countenance still wore a smile which seemed to shed a yellow luster all about the room, and gleamed on little Marigold's image, and on the other objects that had been transmuted by the touch of Midas. "'Well, friend Midas,' said the stranger, "'pray how do you succeed with the golden touch?' Midas shook his head. "'I am very miserable,' said he. "'Very miserable, indeed,' exclaimed the stranger. "'And how happens that? Have I not faithfully kept my promise with you?' have you not everything that your heart desired gold is not everything answered midas and i have lost all that my heart really cared for ah so you have made a discovery since yesterday observed the stranger let us see then which of these two things do you think is really worth the most the gift of the golden touch or one cup of clear cold water Oh, blessed water, exclaimed Midas, it will never moisten my parched throat again. The golden touch, continued the stranger, or a crust of bread. A piece of bread, answered Midas, is worth all the gold on earth. The golden touch, asked the stranger, or your own little marigold, warm, soft, and loving as she was an hour ago. Oh, my child, my dear child, cried poor Midas, wringing his hands, I would not have given that one small dimple in her chin for the power of changing this whole big earth into a solid lump of gold. You are wiser than you were, King Midas, said the stranger, looking seriously at him. Your own heart, I perceive, has not been entirely changed from flesh to gold. Were it so, your case would indeed be desperate but you appear to be still capable of understanding that the commonest things such as lie within everybody's grasp are more valuable than the riches which so many mortals sigh and struggle after 
tell me now do you sincerely desire to rid yourself of this golden touch it is hateful to me replied midas a fly settled on his nose but immediately fell to the floor for it too had become gold midas shuddered go then said the stranger and plunge into the river that glides past the bottom of your garden take likewise a vase of the same water and sprinkle it over any object that you may desire to change back again from gold into its former substance if you do this in earnestness and sincerity it may possibly repair the mischief which your avarice has occasioned king midas bowed low and when he lifted his head the lustrous stranger had vanished you will easily believe that midas lost no time in snatching up a great earthen pitcher but alas me it was no longer earthen after he touched it and hastening to the riverside as he scampered along and forced his way through the shrubbery it was positively marvellous to see how the foliage turned yellow behind him as if the autumn had been there and nowhere else on reaching the river's brink he plunged headlong in without waiting so much as to pull off his shoes poof 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 snorted king midas as his head emerged out of the water well this is really a refreshing bath and i think it must have quite washed away the golden touch and now for filling my pitcher as he dipped the pitcher into the water it gladdened his very heart to see it change from gold into the same good honest earthen vessel which it had been before he touched it he was conscious also of a change within himself a cold hard and heavy weight seemed to have gone out of his bosom no doubt his heart had been gradually losing its human substance and transmuting itself into insensible metal but had now softened back again into flesh perceiving a violet that grew on the bank of the river midas touched it with his finger and was overjoyed to find that the delicate flower retained its purple hue instead of undergoing a yellow blight the curse of the golden touch had therefore really been removed from him king midas hastened back to the palace and i suppose the servants knew not what to make of it when they saw their royal master so carefully bringing home an earthen pitcher of water but that water which was to undo all the mischief that his folly had wrought was more precious to midas than an ocean of molten gold could have been the first thing he did as you need hardly be told was to sprinkle it by handfuls over the golden figure of little marigold no sooner did it fall on her than you would have laughed to see how the rosy colour came back to the dear child's cheek and how she began to sneeze and sputter and how astonished she was to find herself dripping wet and her father still throwing more water over her pray do not dear father cried she see how you have wet my nice frock which i put on only this morning for marigold did not know that she had been a little golden statue nor could she remember anything that had happened since the moment when she ran with outstretched arms to comfort poor king midas her father did not think it necessary to tell his beloved child how very foolish he had been but contented himself with showing how much wiser he had now grown for this purpose he led little marigold into the garden where he sprinkled all the remainder of the water over the rose bushes and with such good effect that above five thousand roses recovered their beautiful bloom there were two circumstances however which as long as he lived used to put king midas in mind of the golden touch one was that the sands of the river sparkled like gold the other that little marigold's hair had now a golden tinge which he had never observed in it before she had been transmuted by the effect of the kiss this change of hue was really an improvement and made marigold's hair richer than in her babyhood when king midas had grown quite an old man and used to trot marigold's children on his knee he was fond of telling them this marvellous story pretty much as i have now told it to you and then would he stroke their glossy ringlets and tell them that their hair likewise had a rich shade of gold which they had inherited from their mother and to tell you the truth 
my precious little folks quoth king midas diligently trotting the children all the while ever since that morning i have hated the very sight of all other gold save this end of section six section seven of a wonder book for boys and girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Wonder Book for Boys and Girls by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Section 7. Shadowbrook. After the Story of the Golden Touch. Well, children, inquired Eustace, who was very fond of eliciting a definite opinion from his auditors, did you ever, in all your lives, listen to a better story than this of the Golden Touch? why as to the story of king midas said saucy primrose it was a famous one thousands of years before mr eustace bright came into the world and will continue to be so long after he quits it but some people have what we may call the leaden touch and make everything dull and heavy that they lay their fingers upon you are a smart child primrose to be not yet in your teens said eustace taken rather aback by the piquancy of her criticism but you well know in your naughty little heart that i have burnished the old gold of midas all over anew and have made it shine as it never shone before and then that figure of marigold do you perceive no nice workmanship in that and how finely i have brought out and deepened the moral what say you sweet fern dandelion clover periwinkle would any of you after hearing this story be so foolish as to desire the faculty of changing things to gold i should like said periwinkle a girl of ten to have the power of turning everything to gold with my right forefinger but with my left forefinger i should want the power of changing it back again if the first change did not please me and i know what i would do this very afternoon pray tell me said eustace why answered periwinkle i would touch every one of these golden leaves on the trees with my left forefinger and make them all green again so that we might have the summer back at once with no ugly winter in the meantime oh periwinkle cried eustace bright there you are wrong and would do a great deal of mischief were i midas i would make nothing else but such golden days as these over and over again all the year throughout my best thoughts always come a little too late why did not i tell you how old king midas came to america and changed the dusky autumn such as it is in other countries into the burnished beauty which it here puts on he gilded the leaves of the great volume of nature cousin eustace said sweet fern a good little boy who was always making particular inquiries about the precise height of giants and the littleness of fairies how big was marigold and how much did she weigh after she was turned to gold she was about as tall as you are replied eustace and as gold is very heavy she weighed at least two thousand pounds and might have been coined into thirty or forty thousand gold dollars i wish primrose were worth half as much come little people let us clamber out of the dell and look about us they did so the sun was now an hour or two beyond its noontide mark and filled the great hollow of the valley with its western radiance so that it seemed to be brimming with mellow light and to spill it over the surrounding hillsides like golden wine out of a bowl it was such a day that you could not help saying of it there never was such a day before although yesterday was just such a day and to-morrow will be just such another ah but there are very few of them in a twelve-month circle it is a remarkable peculiarity of these october days that each of them seems to occupy a great deal of space although the sun rises rather tardily at that season of the year and goes to bed as little children ought at sober six o'clock or even earlier we cannot therefore call the days long but they appear somehow or other to make up for their shortness by their breadth 
and when the cool night comes we are conscious of having enjoyed a big armful of life since morning come children come cried eustace bright more nuts more nuts more nuts fill all your baskets and at christmas time i will crack them for you and tell you beautiful stories so away they went all of them in excellent spirits except little dandelion who i am sorry to tell you had been sitting on a chestnut burr and was stuck as full as a pincushion of its prickles dear me how uncomfortable he must have felt End of section seven.